Tonight on EKB Evening News at 6, a community comes to the aid of the family of a sick child. Good evening, I'm Gary Sloan. And I'm Jill Fraley Dotson. Cindy has the night off. The family of an Elkhorn City toddler has been through an emotional whirlwind over the past year. After he was diagnosed with neuroblastoma last year, he overcame the disease, but now has been diagnosed with acute myeloid lymphoma. Now his community is rallying to support the family by doing everything they can. EKB News reporter Shelby Steele talked with the family and the mayor of Elkhorn City to get their thoughts. She files this report. On July 2nd, 2014, Baby Clay Allen's parents took him to the hospital for what they thought would be a typical pump knot caused by a little boy being too rough. They were shocked, however, when Baby Clay was diagnosed with stage 4 intermediate risk neuroblastoma. During the third month of being in remission, Baby Clay was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, which was caused by the chemo radiation he endured to cure the neuroblastoma. Baby Clay's mother, Trista Allen, says this is very rare. Which was extremely, extremely, like, first case they've seen of this happening that his oncologist had mentioned of ever seeing a child develop leukemia with the doses of chemo that he had because they were so extraordinarily low dose. The Allen family, excluding the two older children, has been in the hospital now for five weeks. Trista Allen explains that along with leukemia, Baby Clay's immune system is weak. Now, members of the community are stepping up to support the Allen family. Friday, May 22nd, from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., Elkhorn City Mayor Mike Taylor is hosting a bone marrow drive at Elkhorn City Hall. Taylor says he will even come to you. I'm willing to go anywhere that anybody would want to be tested. And all it is, it's like from the swab of your mouth, it's like swabs, like a Q-tip. You go in to swab the mouth, and that's all it is. And then what it does, it goes into the bone marrow bank in Cleveland, Ohio. They send you a letter stating that, you know, they've tested and what type, what it is. Then if you're a match for him, they just contact you personally. They don't come through me or anybody like that. They will come through you, contact you personally. Taylor adds he hopes everyone finds it in their heart to support baby Clay. I just hope that people will come out and do it for this little guy. I mean, this is very important. And I can always say this, when you look at your children and you hold your children in your arms, you feel how lucky that you are that your kid is healthy. And this little boy's been through a lot. Trista Allen hopes baby Clay gets well soon so he can finally enjoy being a child. We're hoping and praying that, you know, God blesses him to just have to have one treatment and it be in remission, you know, because being his mother, he deserves a summer. He's not had a summer. He's not had, I'm sorry, he's not been able to have the typical life that a child deserves. I mean, his first two years have been up in the hospital. For EKB Evening News at 6, I'm Shelby Steele. Residents who live around Carter Lane and 5th Street in Paintsville have been noticing issues with their homes and roadways over the past two months, and they fear the problems are only going to get worse. The issue is a landslide caused by severe weather back in March, which has residents say has gone unresolved since that time. EKB News reporter Courtney Lovern visited the neighborhood and brings us this report. Every day, Jim and Debbie Shell have to walk 500 feet, rain or shine, just to make it to their home. Along this road, there are cracks, breaks, and narrow turns to get to their house at the top of the hill. It's been really hard getting home. We have no access to medical, police, fire, nothing. And anything we get, we usually have to carry it home. We have to walk in and walk out. Carter Lane in the city of Paintsville leads to two households, the Daniels and the Shells. Since March, these two couples, along with five other families, have been dealing with home and property damage from a landslide. Dale Daniel and his wife Ruby are another family affected by the slide. The foundation's cracking, the posts up front here on the porch is cracking, cracks in the plaster drywall inside, the uh, water lines, sewer lines has been pulled apart and had to repair those a couple of times and put them on top of the ground. The slide is bigger than the surveyors originally thought and blue ribbon marks boundaries around the affected area. Seven homes between Carter Lane and Fifth Street are in danger of being overtaken by the slide. Yeah. Mayor Bob Porter commented on the situation. And certainly I'd like folks to know, and I, and I believe they do know, that we're doing everything that can possibly be done to assist them. Uh, I've spoken to, um, uh, if not all the property owners, 
virtually all the property owners uh, many times about this situation and uh, have advised them that there's there's really no good solutions at this point in time other than uh, to seek uh, mitigation assistance from, from FEMA. The city has hired an engineer and others to assess the situation and will be sending in an application to FEMA. The families affected just want some help. We need to first of all help the people at home and in the United States because like Nepal when they had the earthquake we gave money for them within so many hours we gave them a million dollars but yet we're having trouble you know it's already been two months and we're still waiting for FEMA the federal government somebody to help we're still waiting for answers reporting for EKB evening news at 6 I'm Courtney Levern the second person charged for a Robinson Creek Railroad tunnel fire last year has now been arrested 32-year-old Harlan K. Dameron of Wellington was arrested yesterday. Today, he appeared before U.S. Magistrate Judge Edward B. Atkins to answer conspiracy and arson charges. He pleaded not guilty. On Tuesday, co-defendant Ricky D. Johnson also pleaded not guilty. Johnson was allowed to remain free pending the men's July 28th trial. But a detention hearing has now been ordered for Dameron. In court, Judge Atkins said Dameron appeared to pose a flight risk due to previous instances of not appearing in court to answer other charges and order that he remain in jail until his detention hearing. A Logan man faces a federal weapons charge and is expected to plead guilty in coming days. Brian Keith Conley is accused of making false statements in October when attempting to purchase three guns from Tri-State Gun and Pawn. Specifically, Conley allegedly said he had never been convicted of a domestic violence charge, even though he was convicted of domestic battery in 2003. The weapons charge was filed yesterday along with a motion to set a hearing in order for Conley to plead guilty. That hearing has not yet been set. Well, coming up, we'll update you on one local animal shelter's efforts to reduce its cat population. And Pike County is taking steps to improve emergency communications in rural areas. We'll be back in two minutes. As we reported yesterday, the Pike County Animal Shelter is at full capacity when it comes to cats. In order to prevent certain death for some of these animals, Pike County Deputy Judge Executive Brian Morris has contacted the Appalachian SPCA for help. Morris has found an anonymous donor who will pay the adoption fee for cats until the overpopulation at the shelter is under control. Yesterday, the shelter started with 92 cats and 29 were adopted. With that being said, 18 more were brought in to the animal shelter just yesterday, so the problem still remains. Thanks to the anonymous donor, the Appalachian SPCA, and Deputy Judge Executive Brian Morris, cats and kittens will have their first shots and those adopting one will be made an appointment for its spay or neuter. All cat adoptions are free until the overpopulation is under control. The shelter has cats and kittens in all colors. Shelter hours are today through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you would like to donate to the Appalachian SPCA to prevent this in the future, log on to AppalachianSPCA.org. Communication between dispatchers and first responders working in rural parts of Pike County is crucial, but sometimes not very reliable. However, a decision made by the Pine County Fiscal Court yesterday will alleviate many existing issues. EKB News reporter Shannon Deskins has the story. When fire departments, ambulances, and law enforcement officials respond to calls in Pike County, they rely on one of seven repeater sites throughout the county to communicate with dispatchers. But the towers located on mountaintops in very rural areas are plagued with challenges. For example, when a tower site loses power, the emergency management office in Pikeville only knows about it when communication with first responders fail. There's been instances where uh, fire departments have been paged out and not answered, and that's the only way sometimes we've been able to find out that there's a problem at a site. However, all of that is about to change. At yesterday's Pike County Fiscal Court meeting, the court voted to enter into an agreement with local company Skynet Communications to provide high-speed internet services at each tower site. And once the internet service is established at the tower, Skynet officials will then start working to also provide services to area residents. 
Once we build out this infrastructure with the county, we're going to uh, move to a, a platform called WiMAX, and that's going to provide service in areas that doesn't exactly have a line of sight. And the towers that the county has, they're in a lot of rural places that are underserved right now, so it really works great in correlation with what we're doing and what they need. Doug Tackett said that this new service will also let them tackle another big problem, and that is vandalism. Until now, catching anyone vandalizing or stealing equipment has been nearly impossible, but that will change soon. We had some vandalism a week or so ago, that uh, we and we had cameras at the site, but the cameras were destroyed and the DVR at the site was destroyed as well. But this way, with the cameras at the site, if you destroy the cameras, we've still got you recorded here at the office with the internet links. And that is because all videos and pictures will be instantly transmitted and stored at the 911 office in Pikeville. Officials expect the Skynet services to go online in early summer. For EKB Evening News at 6, I'm Shannon Deskins. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Democratic Senator Edward Markey of Massachusetts are calling on Surgeon General Vivek Murthy to issue a report on prescription pill and heroin abuse. The senators made their request in a letter to the Department of Health and Human Services in order to measure the federal response to opioid addiction and overdose deaths. The senators note that their home states had more than a thousand overdose deaths in 2014. In Kentucky, a third of those deaths were caused by heroin. Well, coming up, district champions are being crowned across the mountains. Jamie Johnson will be in with the details. But first, EKB Chief Meteorologist Lathan Hopkins will be here with a look at our forecast. We'll be back in two minutes. So we turned the thermometer back a little bit today. Really? What happened? Did you, wow. Do you need the heat on? Yes. It is very possible. Some folks may have had to switch back over from AC to heat as temperatures today struggle to break out of the 50s. Did not expect wow. that today. Yeah, big, big cool down. And on top of that, a cold rain falling across the region. Doppler radar showing the rain that is currently making its way across the bluegrass and into parts of West Virginia and Southwest Virginia as well. Watching this gusty band of showers move from northern parts of Pike County into Central Floyd and Knott County as we speak. Right along this little system here, you can see the brighter greens. Could get some heavier rain and maybe some gusty winds from that. We'll zoom in a little closer. You can see some of the areas that will be impacted right along 119 here within the next 10 minutes from Pikeville to Williamson and points south along 23 uh, from Pikeville down toward Virgie. A gustier band of showers will eventually be making its way into your region here, like I said, within the next 10 or 15 minutes. The big story today, the cloud cover and the rain keeping temperatures very, very chilly. How chilly are we talking? Well, this is currently 54 degrees in Pikeville, in Prestonsburg, 56 in Paintsville, 54 in Sawyersville. We have 47 showing up right now in Dorton. Now these temperatures are about anywhere between 15 and 25 degrees colder than this time yesterday. As a matter of fact, 20 degrees colder right now in Pikeville, almost 20 in Prestonsburg, about 24 degrees cooler in the past 24 hours in Williamson. Yes, a big cool down. The high today, 61 degrees. That was at 12.07 this morning, just after midnight. The official low, 52. That was at 2.59 this afternoon. So totally opposite than what we normally see. This is more like what we'd expect as far as the daytime temperatures go in early March, mid-March. Here we are exactly one month from summer, the official start of summer, and the, high, and the average temperature today around 52 degrees. It's absolutely hard to believe. Satellite and radar composite. I want you to notice the clearing, though, that is taking place southern parts of Indiana, Illinois. That clearing line is moving to the south, and once that moves in, temperatures will cool down overnight tonight and allow for some patchy, dense fog overnight tonight and for the Friday morning commute. So something to definitely keep in mind as you head out and about tomorrow morning. All right, pollen count time sponsored by Faith Pharmacy, Adams Plaza in Pikeville. Friday, 8.0 out of a possible 12. And we stay right around that same category for Saturday before back above 9 as we head in to Sunday. All right, that all-important seven-day forecast, which does include, of course, 
the long holiday weekend. Saturday, 78 degrees. Tomorrow, 72. Back in the 80s, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Best chance of rain, though. Holding off until Tuesday and Wednesday. So get ready for temperatures tonight in the 40s. And tomorrow, finally, back in the low 70s. Thank goodness. The man, oh man, bundle up tomorrow morning. Chilly, chilly, yes, chilly indeed. out there. All right, Lathan, thank you. <laughs> Stay with us. Sports is next. Well, Jamie, I understand UK released a part of its schedule? Yes, uh, finally. We've had, we've had the teams just didn't know where they went on the calendar. Now we do. We'll get to some district play in the high school softball, high school baseball action in a minute. But first, the University of Kentucky released its non-conference men's basketball schedule late this afternoon, featuring eight home games along with three neutral side games and only two true away games. Let's take a look at this beginning with the Cats regular season home opener hosting the Great Danes of the University of Albany, New York on Friday, November 13th as part of the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame Classic. Now the following day, Kentucky will meet the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Now don't laugh, NJIT defeated Michigan on the road last season. Hope it don't happen to us. Former Duke Blue Devil Bobby Hurley, who brought Buffalo last year to Rupp Arena, will now lead his new team, the Arizona State Sun Devils, to Lexington on Saturday, December 12th. Kentucky will spar with Louisville on the last Saturday of the year. The games include a matchup with Duke in the Champions Classic on the road in Chicago, and also games at UCLA and at Allen Fieldhouse in Kansas on my birthday. Who's buying tickets for that? To the action on the field from last night, the Pineville Panthers were going for their 7th consecutive 59th District Championship, taking on Eastridge at Davis Park. Cody Eastep sends this shot to left field, and that would bring across Pikeville's first run of the game. Eastep will pull in the second base with a double. Next up, Michael McDonald, Sweet Freedom. Yes, shine your light on me. The crush to center field, bringing East Step around to score. McDonald will get a triple out of this. Pikeville well on their way to a district crown. Now Clay Sloan, look how easy he made that. Clay Sloan will demonstrate the safety squeeze with this bunt. Throw the first, McDonald waits, takes off right, Grease Lightning, scores, and Pikeville claims another 59th district tournament crown. The, the 58th District Tournament over in Floyd County, either the Prestonsburg Black Cats or the Allen Central Rebels have won the last 10 district tournament titles dating back to 2005. These rivals met again last night as we take you to W.J. Turner Field at Drift. Allen Central bases loaded, trailing 1-0. Brett Sammons strikes out swinging. Rebels left eight men on base in this one last night. Later, Dustin Johnson line out to resize it at third. The throw the first. 5-3 double play if you're scoring at home. Black Cats pitcher Jaron Hall looking to go the distance. Gets Sammons to start the seventh inning. Staring. Cameron Blevins next leadoff man. Rung up by home plate umpire Pete Runyon. And then Dustin Johnson waves and misses. Prestonsburg wins their fifth consecutive 58th district tournament title with a 1-0 shutout. Other scores from around the area, a champion was crowned in the 57th district as Paintsville defeated Crosstown rival Johnson Central 6-5, Tigers' first district championship since 2006. In the 60th district finals, Lawrence County shut out Belfry 7-zip. One softball championship determined last night in the 58th district as South Floyd scored six runs in the first. Senior Brittany Dawson homeward. Lady Raiders won their fourth district championship in six years, 11 to five over Betsy Lane. Tonight, weather permitting, softball play, Johnson Central and McGuffin County will decide the 57th district championship and Lawrence County will take on Pike Central for the 60th district title. And that is sports. Busy, busy time. Hey, good to be on the field last night. I've been away for a couple nights, out on the field, watching some things. It's been good to be out there. Yeah, thanks, But I, I miss being in here, too. i got to be two places at once. It's tough. You, you can't be. I know. But you can try. You can do better. I try. I've tried my best. <laughs> All right, Jamie, thank you. All right. Stay with us. We'll be back in just two minutes.
A chilly night tonight, Lathan. Temperatures back down in the 40s and watch out for some patchy dense fog, but tomorrow looking much better, mostly sunny 72 and then 78 as we head into the weekend. 80s return Sunday into Monday, and of course, you can get the latest forecast in tomorrow's Appalachian News Express. Very good, thank you. All right, Debbie, what's on tonight? Well, West Friends tonight, so get a blanket or build a fire. Thank you, Lathan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but West Friends tonight here on EKBT. Make sure you get a bucket of popcorn to go along yeah, with that. Be good. Be good to have. Yeah. That will do it for tonight's EKB Evening News. Remember, you can get more local news anytime by listening to the radio stations of East Kentucky Broadcasting. You can also follow EKB News and EKB TV on Facebook and on Twitter. We leave you tonight with some flowers down by the river. Good night and thanks for watching.